to do right now. I have both, in case anybody has a strong preference. <laughs> yeah, we're all going to fight. Yeah, I mean, here's the title for this one, and then yes, I think, where's the other one? There's that one, there's this one, you know? Then we walk away. What? Then we walk away. Oh, wait, you want this one, and then, or, or you walk away? Okay, everybody's fine with this one? I guess I don't know. To be honest, like, uh... Are you guys like, uh, I mean, so this is actually my first time ever even participating in Splash 5, so I also don't have like a very good feel for, for the group of people who come to this. Um, especially given that Jan has managed to involve the meetup groups in Boston, so it seems to be like really a mixture of people, like um, long-time academics and people who are working in startups in Boston, so just a heads up, but I guess this is how it's supposed to be. Um, anyway, so as I, as I said, oh, I'm just going to start now, it seems like people are here. Um, so, as I said just a moment ago, if you just walked in, um, this is kind of a, you know, the purpose of this talk is really to give a, a summary of some di various distributed programming languages to give kind of a high level view of, of some of them that have existed over the years, and then kind of to sort of, you know, hop over a few more in the last few years and sort of try to answer the question about, you know, why are we developing new compilers all the time only for distributed programming. Um, and this talk came out of a course uh, that I, I taught at Northeastern University in the fall of 2016. Um, it was a it was a research seminar, um, and we had a you know it's it actually very cool. It was lots of PhD students and master students and bachelor students. It was kind of like equal thirds. Um, made it really fun, and actually everybody even kind of helped write kind of a, a chapter of like an online book, basically that we wrote about various. Um, Sort of building blocks for distributed programming. Uh, and so, in case you actually you know you want to poke around, um, it's called the the web. So, it's not meant to be easy to navigate because I don't want people to think that this is like you know some beautiful, wonderful, finished thing. Um, but the URL is distprogbook.com slash, and then choose a chapter. I don't have a landing page because, like I said, I don't want this to be it's not finished. So I don't want this to be something that people like regularly refer to as it's changing. Uh, but you can poke around if you want. Um, and since this is a, a talk that I originally gave with, uh, you know, this, this Papers We Love group, um, you know, I, I, I always like to, to sort of give the, the folks that work at startups and whatnot, like, this, this view of what I think research actually looks like, because I think to them it looks very different. Um, and, I, I mean, you know, I think research is actually very, very animated, and I think that, you know, if you are like working in a startup or something and you're kind of iterating very quickly on in like these short windows of time, um, you, maybe it doesn't seem like it's actually animated and moving very fast from the outside. Um, instead, I think that people think that research kind of looks like this where you've got 
um, you know, nothing happening over long periods of time, and everything is delivered via PDF, and um, you know, these things. Uh, some of these things have a tendency to be maybe very way too way too divorced from reality with. Um, like these motivational statements that lack kind of real world context, right? Like, I mean, I think this is the view of often of research, whereas I tried to, you know, show them that no, no, I think, I think instead actually research is, is a little bit more animated. There are these multi year um, long evolving sorts of animated debates that form, a, uh, you know, entire fields between different researchers. And I mean, maybe it looks kind of crazy on the outside, but it's this crazy race between a handful of researchers that happens to just be delivered via PDFs every every year or two, right? Um, and uh, you know, if you can start like piecing together the some of the interesting points that came out of one paper that influenced another paper, I mean, you know, you start to see it in this more animated light. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, I, I, I like I like pointing this out to folks that uh, don't actually participate in the whole research world. Um, and and at that point, you know, I like, say, okay, if you if you uh, write a bunch of software for some startup, then you probably know of a couple of distributed programming languages. Um, I but somebody's got to name one that they know to use for distribution. What, what is like the a very popular one that everybody's using nowadays? Yeah. Java. Okay, it's kind of distributed programming language, sure. But like, what's what's more, you know, distribution first? Erlang. Yay! Yes, everybody's talking about Erlang. Everybody uses Erlang. Uh, lots of people use Erlang actually, even though it may not seem like it. Um, but there's of course lots of others, um, and many of them did not catch on in any sort of um, industrial context, and some of them aren't even programming languages at all. <coughs> some of these that are libraries, um, and and today I'm just going to I, I mean you know I want to want to, to oops, I want to show some interesting threads between them, but I can't talk about all of them, so I'm going to hop around between uh, these six just to kind of give a, give a quick Sorry. quick. Hmm? There's seven? There's seven. Oh, there is seven. Yeah. Right. <laughs> oh no! More time spent. So now to so ramble that. longer. Okay, so that it doesn't. Right. Yeah, I know. Some of them don't count as languages, but you know, we're gonna talk. We're gonna talk about that. <laughs> anyway, yes, these things that are programming models for distributed programming. Um, yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna hop through them, and we're gonna talk about maybe some things that are similar and different, and where some or some ideas originally came from that we use now. Um, and one, one paper that you can't really, or one, one language that you can't really skip over if you're interested in this world is um, um, a language called Argus that uh, was, I think, initially published in 1988. Um, it's, uh, it's, by, uh, it's initially proposed by Barbara Liskov. Um, and uh, I mean, I think everybody knows uh, Barbara Liskov from, you know, things, especially in, in, in object-oriented land, um, you know, substitution principle and all of these things. Um, you know, programming languages land, we, we kind of recognize her for that, but I think uh, fewer people uh, know about this language called Argus. I mean, if you're interested in distributed programming, I'm sure you've encountered it before. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting language, and we're going we're gonna to hop through a, a few points about where it came from. Um, so what's what's interesting about this uh, in 1988 was um, you know there's sort of, she sort of begins by noting that there are a number of things that can go wrong in the context of of programs that operate uh, across multiple nodes we all know this I think at this point um, but you know some some points that she raises which were maybe not such a big concerns at the time were well okay both the nodes and the network may fail um, you can uh, the network may lose or delay the delivery of messages. Uh, messages may be delivered out of order, yet despite that, programs should remain running. That's a, that's a noble goal, right? Uh, and in addition to that, you should also be able to, uh, despite nodes going down or, um, or you know, interruptions in the network, the data uh, should also remain uh, consistent, right? So that's, that's like, you know, design constraint number one, the, the first set of design constraints in Argus. Um, so nodes may fail, uh, but data must, must remain consistent. Uh, and, I mean, this kind of translates into, okay, we should have then strong consistency in this language where distribution is a possibility. So that was kind of like design constraint number one, or design decision number one. Um, and she brings up in this, in this paper this example of a banking application. Um, and basically, uh, she, she points out that, you know, you have various concurrent activities that may interfere with one another. So one example is a transfer. Uh, so if you have a transfer running concurrently with an audit, the audit might record uh, a total that includes withdrawal, but uh, but not the deposit, right? So these things are, uh, you know, they might interfere with one another, I guess, is the observation here. Um, and then 
uh, if, you, if you assume that something crashes or um, you know, you, maybe a crash immediately after the withdrawal, um, then you know, we should be able to have some kind of like, uh, you know, okay, well, something crashed, so we have to fix this, right? So in this case, uh, put the money back into the from account or wait for the transfer uh, uh, to uh, wait for the transfer until the other, uh, wait to complete the transfer until the other, other machine recovers, right? So these are, this is like, an, like a motivating example in 1988, uh, which was not too far-fetched. Um, and uh, she proposed, okay, well, given, these, given this problem, uh, and given sort of like this observation that, uh, you know, things may fail and we should probably try to, you know, uh, keep, keep consistency in the language, she proposes Argus. Um, and uh, sort of the, the main, um, sort of like the main kind of concept, there's two, two, two main concepts that, that Argus introduces. Um, the first is this idea of a thing called a guardian, which is a special object uh, that, um, uh, basically run, like, so you make requests to it and it runs processes, uh, or procedures, excuse me, in, in response to, to these, these requests that are made remotely. Um, and uh, all of these sort of, um, these, these, these computations and whatnot, these things should be, should be um, run as, as atomic transactions. So everything is organized in terms of these things called guardians, uh, and you make requests to them, they do something, and, you know, everything should be kind of organized in, 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 into these uh, atomic transactions. Um, and she, I mean, I'm going to just, uh, you know, read the sort of the quotes here uh, to solve the problems of, of concurrency and failures that we just kind of talked about on the, on the slide before. Um, Argus, basically the idea was that Argus would uh, allow computations to be run as, uh, as these atomic transactions, which she names actions. Um, and, you know, everything is sort of coordinated with these, these things called guardians. Um, and uh, the idea sort of is... Uh, uh, you know, these guardians should be able to, it's an abstract object who, uh, whose purpose is to encapsulate our resource or resources. Um, and, uh, you know, basically th this, this, I mean, this is actually a picture, and I think I, uh, the picture is missing some pieces. Uh, but the idea is that, uh, you know, uh, like the state should be encapsulated in this object, um, and uh, you shouldn't be able to access the things that this thing can access uh, from the outside. Um, so you should only be able to manipulate the state that's with, that this thing kind of maintains by calls to the so-called handlers. Uh, I'll talk about them in a moment, so hold on to that, that thought. Um, and then, you know, you think about these guardian things as residing on an, on an individual node in the network. So you're kind of imagining them as like one, maybe one node. Um, and, uh, and yeah. Also interesting to note, guardians are supposed to be able to uh, create other guardians dynamically. Um, yeah. Uh, also, so I, I just kind of iterated through these things, so they encapsulate state. Um, they can contain a dynamic collection of, of data objects, but like you have to be able to access them through, through these handler things. Um, and people, I mean, I guess the idea at the time was to think of them as like an abstraction over a node, and you can actually move them around, and you can create other guardians dynamically. Um, and so yes, the, these handler things are how you access uh, the, the state within these things. Um, and uh, oh, yet, you know, there's no way to reference any of the guardian state from outside. You can only ref uh, you know, alter that state via this handler. Uh, and the idea is that these handler calls should always be location independent. Um, just, I mean, you're not supposed to be able to actually read this. This is just kind of like, okay, this is what uh, you know, code in, in Argus looks like. The room is ridiculously long and silly, but uh, in other rooms where I give this talk, it's usually not so bad. But the idea here, um, you know, just to give you a, a quick, just high-level picture of what, how you kind of or, think about organizing programs, uh, what you have is, so this would be like the banking example, where you have um, like a, a guardian that represents a branch, like a banking branch. Um, and uh, the idea is that you would have um, maybe like this, this, this uh, represents the, the banking branch for like, uh, I don't know, Boston or something, of Wells, Wells Fargo. Uh, and you know, then you're supposed to basically be implementing these handlers. Um, oops, these these are these things are handlers, right? Uh, and this over here is a bunch of bunch of state that this thing should be that this actor should be kind of managing. And these handlers, uh, you know, this is a deposit handler, withdrawal handler, uh, you know, calculating the total, etc. So you implement these handlers to be uh, operating on the state that this thing kind of encapsulates. Um, and um, you say, okay. Well, fine. Um, that's a decent high-level picture. We got these kind of—they kind of look like actors, right? Um, but these these guardian thingies. Uh, but the whole thing that we were talking about before, like I mean, we were talking about concurrency and partial failure. 
Uh, and I, I guess you know you can see how concurrency can be addressed by the design that we just saw, but not necessarily partial failure. Um, so how how do we uh, how do we how do we guarantee consistency? Um, and uh, the idea is that uh, well, this goes back to this this thing I mentioned very briefly. Um, uh, uh, this atomic transaction thing, this this idea of this, this these actions. Um, so uh, actions. So again, these are atomic transactions. So um, these these sort of these these actions, what they call them. I mean, basically they have two uh, sort of two guarantees. Uh, they or at least you know we make two assumptions about them. They're serializable. So the effect of running uh, a group of these actions, uh, you know. Would be would mean that they always like you know no matter how you run them they always uh, behave as if they were run sequentially in, in some order uh, and that they're total so an action either completes uh, entirely or it's guaranteed to have no no effect at all um, and uh, you can look at it like uh, the serializability side solves the concurrency problem and the totality solves uh, uh, the, the the partial failure issue um, and then you might ask okay well what about what about uh, well, recovering from such from, from a failure, um, it's actually kind of interesting. There's this idea of versioning uh, in in Argus, where you should be able to recover from uh, from from failures based on sort of rolling back to previous versions. Um, and so you you keep these versions in some kind of volatile memory on each node, and then you roll back in the case of something not being able to be uh, like atomically completed. Um, and everything is done via like all of the actual communication between these these guardians are done uh, via RPC. So, I mean, this is just like a quick, hey, look, this is Argus, this is a thing, it's kind of interesting, it was 1988, and this is, was the idea, and banging was the application that, you know, was sort of focused on in this paper. Um, Christian, yep? In the previous slide, actually, it really says in volatile memory, because the databases usually try to keep that in persistent memory. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so, so yeah. It's not the type, okay? So no, okay, yeah, thank you. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, and one other interesting thing to note is that uh, that uh, I mean, you know, not in the paper that I just I just ran through, but uh, in a follow-up paper, um, promises were actually proposed uh, initially in Argus, uh, and they were typed, and uh, they're very similar to you know the idea of a promise now. Um, so the idea of like some kind of container or something uh, that has a type that is meant to be eventually completed, uh, and you know. It, it should all be completed asynchronously with these RPC calls. Uh, and this was, I think, like 1989 or, or shortly after the, the initial paper. So this is also proposed uh, as part of Argus. So then how did how was Argus realized? Um, to, to somebody uh, implementing languages in 2018, it would be you, you know, very painstakingly in that um, the compiler was completely coupled to the kernel. It required a specific um, a research version of Unix to be able to, to run it, right? It's like basically all baked together. Uh, so, you know, I mean, nowadays that's not so much how we implement, uh, uh, you know, new compilers or, or languages, um, but uh, everything relied upon, like all of the networking and storage, etc., relied on a specific uh, research implementation of Unix, um, which, you know, like I said, in, in, in 19, or I'm sorry, 2018, uh, not, not the most ideal way of, uh, of, 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 you know, quickly throwing together a language, right? This is very, very evolved. Um, another language, uh, so that's Argus, right? Like, hold on to that, hold, you know, just, just try to remember the, the basic shape of Argus. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about Emerald, which was around the same time. And it's really cool, I, I like, so, um, there's lots of folks that come to Splash and Ecop all the time that, that wrote this paper. Um, but I really like the first sentence of the paper because it's something that you know, uh, you know, was written in 1987. That I feel like I know somebody uh, who might say this in 2018. So just to read it out loud: While distributed systems are now commonplace, this is 1987. While distributed systems are now commonplace, the programming of a distributed application is still somewhat of a black art. Still somewhat. Of a, I mean, it's 2018. It's still, that's still very true. Uh, we believe that the complexity of a distributed application is heightened by the lack of programming language support for distribution. I swear to God, Chris says that sentence all the time, Chris Mickeljohn. Um, anyway, uh, so like I said, several of these folks, you might recognize them. This is when they were a little bit younger. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. uh, that's an aside. <laughs> so um, just to give you uh, some context about like, what this language is and where it came from, it's okay, it's, it's like, programming language support for distribution. What does that mean? 
so now we're now we're in you know object oriented land. Um, so uh, uh, Emerald um, came from it's actually an extension of an extension of an extension. Uh, so pre-Emerald, the authors of this paper started with a language that was called Eden, which is itself an extension of another language called uh, concurrent Euclid. Um, and uh, Eden, the, the, the language that we started with that became uh, Emerald, uh, had a notion of, of mobile objects that was extremely expensive. Um, and uh, this, this, these mobile objects uh, supported uh, a, a remote method invocation, right? Um, but the problem is, so I mean, what was, was nice about it is that these objects were location independent and they were mobile. Um, however, uh, each object, uh, as far as I understand, was represented as um, a full Unix process. So, um, you know, sending and receiving was in involving uh, in inter-process communication. So this was, you could imagine that this was expensive, this would take um, milliseconds uh, at a time, just sending messages back and forth. Um, so what ended up happening was, um, again, as far as I can, I, I was not around for this, but as far as I can, I, my archaeology has, has told me, um, basically what ended up happening was, uh, you know, developers would fall back to objects in the previous language in concurrent Euclid. So, uh, you know, whenever you had an operation on the same machine, you would use these, these cheaper objects, these concurrent Euclid objects, and just use shared memory. So it's kind of like, uh, okay, well, this is less expensive, so let's just do this sometimes, and if we really have to, we'll use these expensive uh, mobile objects that have like location dependence and whatnot, um, and uh, you know you can imagine that it gets complicated after some time because you end up with two object uh, models in, in one language, and uh, sort of the goal, uh, one of the goals, one of the main goals of, of Erlang, I'm sorry, of Emerald, not Erlang, um, was uh, a single object model that would be used for both uh, both uh, both so-called programming in the small and programming in the large. So you know, single machine sort of dealing with objects, talking on that machine, and uh, or, or sort of RMI between machines. Um, and just to read a few more quotes because I can't state it as nicely as the authors uh, uh, can. So just to give some more motivation. Um, we believe that the complexity of distributed applications is heightened, heightened by the lack of programming language support for distribution. Okay, we, we established that. For example, most distributed applications are implemented by calling operation system communication primitives, such as send and receive. The programmer is then responsible for locating the communications target, explicitly packaging parameters, and so on. So this is you know, inconvenient to do all of this plumbing. Uh, and with Emerald, we intend to go beyond simple syntactic support for message sending and receiving, uh, and we want to address some of the fundamental semantic problems of distribution. One of which, or a major problem, uh, you know, as, as sort of a, a, attacked by the authors was, you know, having a single model uh, that is used for both, uh, you know, programming on one machine or, you know, these, these objects with, with uh, uh, remote method indication between them. Uh, but other things that also fell out of this, you know, goals of this work, uh, support for abstract types, uh, and an explicit notion of being able to move objects around or where they, where they lived. Uh, but I mean, I should also point out that they wanted this to be performant. They just didn't want there to be uh, just one, one model. They wanted a performant model that would do, support both, both cases. So the three, you know, the, the sort of three, um, uh, you know, pieces of magic that came out of, of, of Emerald um, are, uh, you know, these special objects that have a uh, uniform semantic model of computation. Um, it's, you know, so it, you know, they have some properties, um, so you know, uh, so identity, but identity in the context of the networks, so being able to uh, distinguish, uh, you know, objects in different places on the network. Um, uh, and then, um, I mean, the REST representation operation process, uh, these are all kind of, uh, of, of standard things. Um, let's see. Yeah. Uh, the next thing, uh, so I think, you know, I think we, we, yeah, I think we discussed the whole object thing with the fact that we want to be able to support both, both notions in one system that kind of have the general properties of, of objects and object-oriented languages that we want, but extended to the network. Next thing, um, was important at the time was uh, support for abstract types, so that uh, you know the idea would be that you'd have these systems that um, uh, would be able to you know be so-called open systems where um, you can always add some object to a running system uh, and allow old code to invoke uh, new code uh, with a call to an interface. Um, this is you know we we take this for granted nowadays, but uh, this was this was an explicit design goal back then. And then um, support for distribution, which is actually really just a big bag of, of things that equal support for distribution. 
um, which is, is basically um, that you know some some idea of uh, concurrency, multiple nodes, and object location are in actually integrated into the language. So you have some notion of location in the language. Um, uh, yeah, things like that. Um, and just you know to compare with Argus, how how did we how did how did we realize this? Uh, once again, uh, the compiler was very closely coupled to the kernel. So I will define an interface with the kernel that uh, many operations, uh, you know, that would call down into the kernel, um, and uh, you know, again, it's once once again relying on a specific version of Unix, uh, and also something that was kind of interesting at the time. Um, you know, I mean, we all know what you know research prototype is, right? Like, but uh, you know, one one um, uh, requirement was that only Earl, uh, Emerald would run on the kernel, so that's kind of also a little bit restrictive. But hey, research prototype, right? Um, so these were two very cool languages that had, uh, you know, yep. I was wondering if uh, it's part of your archaeological studies, uh, you <laughs> yeah. actually uncovered uh, if, if Emerald had uh, similar support for, like, you know, issues related to like network reliability and um, reliability. Yeah. So I mean, uh, not, uh, not just just at, 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 at a very so, high level, yes or no? No, no. So <laughs> what I saw was, and I mean, you know, like I did not read everything that existed. About, about Emerald, so you know, there's, I'm sure there's there's more that I might not have uncovered, but uh, you know, it was more it was more important to be able to. It's about abstractions more than. Abstract, yeah, abstractions and not having to do as much like explicit plumbing um, was was more the idea. So it's make it make it more convenient to be a, a programming with objects that might potentially be on different machines, and then be able to refer to objects with like some idea of location on different machines, whereas. Argus was a lot more concerned with actually <coughs> recovering from some sort of failure, rolling back something like. Um, okay, and so we know about Erlang, so this one really took off, right? Um, I mean, I, I'm going I'm to briefly cover Erlang because I feel like, you know, this is a little bit less exotic than uh, some of these older languages that people might uh, either not remember or not have very much experience with. So Erlang is a, is a functional programming language. Uh, the main sort of thing that makes Erlang very, uh, you know, makes Erlang Erlang is this idea of, of a, you know, everything being a lightweight process. So um, you know, and, and these these like you know, you have millions of these running at any given moment, uh, and you know they're very short lived. So you should be able to basically create an, uh, one of these processes, handle one request, and then not ever worry about it. Like who cares, right? So you you know, it's it basically means that you can have millions and millions of these processes running at any given time, and everything, all the communication happens uh, via messages. So pa you know, uh, it's all all uh, message passing. Um, immutability was very important, so that of course means that variables can be assigned once and can't be changed. Uh, and another very important thing that not a lot of other languages uh, picked up on was that the VM was designed for hot swapping. So you should be able to upgrade applications without stopping them. So you know you have many different machines, and you should be able to upgrade the running binaries of some machines that you know you have to make a change to without shutting down the entire system, which you might not even control yourself. Uh, and in addition to Erlang, there's this thing called OTP. It's a it's a, a, a pile of libraries um, that define abstractions in Erlang. So you have then all kinds of things that you can um, you know use to do more sort of rich programming of like of actor hierarchies with supervision and things like that. Um, so there's a number of abstractions that come in this thing called uh, OTP. And uh, just again to you know, since we're we're, we're just going to mention briefly about how how these things are each individually implemented, um, Erlang is implemented uh, as a virtual like you know it, it comes well it's a, it's a programming language with a virtual machine uh, and it's compiled for both uh, Unix Windows. It's a concurrency focused VM. Uh, I mean I like to think of it like a process VM. So rather than um, you know directly connecting to some kind of you know specific OS processes or threads. Uh, it's you know very smart scheduling of many threads and having a has a garbage collector that independently uh, 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 collects per process. Um, so you you know because everything has its own heap in Erlang because all these processes have their own heap, the garbage collection can be done independently. Uh, and again, uh, the, the VM allows this hot code reloading. Um, so that's just a quick okay. Erlang less exotic. I think we we know uh, several of those things already. Um, another language that's totally totally different from any of the things that I just mentioned is called Linda. Uh, I presume people have heard of tuple spaces. Yep. Um, I, I mean, it's to me, it's it's just it's so different from all of the others that it's just it's like it's shocking, right? Um, and what's cool or what's interesting about this paper was that it was proposed as an alternative to message passing because point-to-point -point communication 
was considered not good. Um, and, you know, just to sort of uh, build on that a little bit. Um, so, quoting the paper, um, message passing is a coordination model that arises directly from the architecture of networks. It's not, it's, you know, we have different machines and we have that, like, a model that exactly looks like that network of different machines. Okay, but, um, you know, the use of distributed data structures in a logically, sh in a logically shared memory uh, is a natural and ready, readily understood approach to parallel programming, is the argument. And that doesn't look anything like message passing or point-to-point -point communication between individual nodes, right? That's, that's the point. Like, this is what the programming model looks like, but, you know, the things that we actually try to do with it uh, don't look anything like, you know, what we're programming with, and that's bad. Uh, so, when the people were basically like, well, uh, everybody's obsessed with message passing, that's weird. Um, it's, you're, in, you're obsessed with this for the wrong reason, because, you know, we're trying to cater to the underlying architectures of what we're running on, right? Not how we actually think. So the argument was, um, you know, shared, distributed shared memory is, is more natural, right? But they thought, okay, well, um, you know, the main problem or the main complaint, why distributed shared memory is a bad idea, is mostly because every single ex uh, existing implementation at that point uh, was not scalable, it was very not performant. Uh, so rather than trying to fix that, uh, sort of the, the principal argument in, in the Linda papers were that, well, you know, what if we come up with a, a better way, right? Um, and so the claim, like the, the main claim of this paper was, uh, again, message passing was developed as a consequence uh, of, this, of this complaint about, about uh, you know, making our, making our programming model uh, look like what we're actually running on. Uh, and in order to cater specifically to non-shared memory architectures, because that's that's bad, right? And they believed, okay, uh, you know, we think that a, that a scalable and uh, efficient implementation of shared memory is possible, and Linda is kind of that that attempt. Um, and this was all realized in this idea of tuple spaces. Uh, and tuple spaces are um, virtual associated uh, logically shared memory, so content addressable uh, um, logically shared memory. Um, and the way to think about it is that, uh, well, um, tuple spaces, tuple spaces complain, uh, contain tuples, right? Like it's a big surprise. Um, and uh, you know, the idea is that um, each tuple, uh, each field in the tuple contains um, data in the form of, you know, one of, of several uh, valid types. Uh, so think, even things like arrays and, and structs. Um, but uh, you know, what you think of is actually just a bunch of tuples where. Uh, you know, what you want to do is, is actually operate on them and be able to uh, put these things into the so-called tuple space and be able to pull them out somehow. Um, and uh, so, you know, the, the idea uh, is, is, um, is basically, like, you know, you, you, you produce pieces of data like this, you put it into this big distributed shared memory thing, this associative uh, you know, distributed associative kind of array, I'm sorry, um, uh, shot logically shared memory, uh, and, and you, you, you take it out, right? Um, and there are different ways to, to uh, uh, put things in and take things out. You can do it serially or in parallel. Um, so you have a couple of, uh, of, of operations that, you know, you, sh you know, for creating and inserting or for pulling out or, or reading out some of these things. So the two main ones. Um, are, are serial, uh, I'm sorry, are out and, and eval. Uh, out is serial, so uh, you know, just one by one create uh, data and insert it serially via this thing. Um, and uh, a parallel version where you, uh, you evaluate, uh, uh, you, you use it to um, create tuples in parallel and insert them, basically. Um, and, okay, I keep saying it's an associative, uh, logically shared, it's associative logically shared memory, cool. Um, but what does that mean? Uh, it means that these things, you know, they don't have any addresses. You have to pull them out via what's inside of them. Um, and uh, uh, you, you basically, you know, you can come up with combinations of things that are in their fields to try and find them and pull them out. Um, and the, the operations that you, do to, you, you use to do that are read and remove. So as it sounds, uh, read basically finds something that matches some kind of pattern that you give it. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then, you know, it's, uh, it sort of destructures it and consumes, consumes it the, 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 by, by the thread that actually uh, 
uh, runs this code, and then remove uh, does the same thing, but it actually pulls it out of the tuple space so it cannot be consumed by anybody else in the future. It's kind of the idea. Um, but uh, like I said, this is all based on patterns, which mean you know, uh, you've got uh, maybe a tuple with, I don't know, in this case, five elements. Uh, it will pull out a tuple, the, you know, the first tuple that it finds with, uh, with this value A in the, in the first field, basically. Uh, which means also that it might be a little bit difficult if you want something very specific out of the, out of, out of the tuple space, because it will just take whatever the first thing is that it finds that it matches. Uh, which is maybe a little bit difficult uh, for some people to wrap their minds around. However, the argument still is that uh, this, is, this is good. Um, and the reason why that, you know, that it's believed that this is good uh, at the time was um, it basically uh, it, 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 it basically it's, it's loose coupling between different processes. So you don't have to have an actor be spun up, uh, and then if two weeks later somebody's you know like is going to consume a message from that actor, you don't need to have both of these two actors uh, you know existing waiting to talk to each other all this time. Uh, you can just put a tuple in this tuple space, and then two weeks later when somebody actually needs to consume it, they can pull it out, right? So you don't need to be actually doing this this uh, coordinating between two different, uh, you know, two different actors in point-to-point -point communication. So, yeah, uh, as I just said, the producers of tuples don't have to, to coexist with consumers since tuples remain in the, in the tuple space until they're explicitly removed, which is kind of nice, right? Um, so a bunch, of, a bunch of sort of communication that you don't have to actually write code to reason about. Um, and uh, we're, again, we're going to go quickly over, well, how is it implemented? Uh, a language extension. So um, the Linda Parallel language was actually, uh, like, it, I guess it was, uh, there were variants for C and Fortran that automatically generated uh, uh, or sort of optimized code for, for ker the kernel libraries for each of these uh, languages. Uh, and basically, this was much more portable because um, you know, it, it's easier to support, uh, you know, all of the, all of, you know, it's easier to port C or, or, or Fortran for individual kernels rather than uh, to rely upon, uh, you know, to have to do this individually per kernel as you develop Linda, right? So it's actually uh, pretty cool because it was a little bit more portable than some of the previous, the previous um, systems or the previous languages. So I'm going to quickly mention um, now after we, we talked about uh, uh, Erlang, right? Um, many years later, uh, a library, not uh, not an actual uh, language, appeared uh, called Scala Actors, and um, this. Uh, so you know, actually, what's really neat about this work um, was that it, you know, kind of call on uh, you know actors on the the JVM. It was kind of a, a cool movement that still sort of uh, exists via this this framework called Aqua that a lot of people are, uh, are familiar with. Started as this project called Scala Actors in 2006. Uh, and then eventually, uh, Akka became the the uh, winning uh, actor implementation at Scala for the JVM, and people use it now from Java. Um, but back in 2005 or 2006, really, the the question so this forget about distributed programming languages, forget about distributed programming in general. Um, there's a you know Martin Odersky and, and Philip Haller were sitting around talking about well, you know Scala's ability to be you know just this wonderful general purpose language. And what ended up happening was, uh, as a master's project, Martin asked Philip to implement Erlang in Scala, whatever that means, right? Um, so, you know, more concretely, that meant, well, uh, can we can we get can we have this notion of an Erlang process, uh, you know, realized within Scala somehow? Um, but of course, the the main issue is that, like, well, there's this nice VM, right? Uh, so, you know, all of that work of switching between all the processes and whatnot, uh, and then having you know independently garbage collected. Uh, processes because they have all their own heaps and all of that. Like this relied upon some support in the VM, and well, since Scala is on the JVM, that's obviously you know we don't have control over over you know the JVM, and there's a super heavyweight threading model. Like clearly that's not going to work. Um, however, you know, well, you know, maybe maybe hey, maybe we can do some of this process management that the Erlang VM does, uh, but we can maybe we do it as a library, and and you know we do some smart scheduling and we map down uh, everything to some J to a handful of JVM threads. So that was the idea. Um, and it, it worked. Um, so effectively, what they did was they uh, created these, you know, these Scala actors, which were basically uh, lightweight processes that looked kind of like Erlang actors, and they implemented it on top of the fork join pool, uh, which was a new thing back in 2006. Uh, and it was a big deal because it meant that you didn't have these heavyweight, uh, heavyweight uh, threads anymore that you had to like manually mess with. Right? You could just create and forget about a bunch of actors in the same way that you could 
uh, in Erlang. So that was cool, but the most interesting thing I think about this was that it was just implemented as a regular Scala library uh, running on unmodified JVM, and uh, I mean, Akka is still the same, so actually we didn't even need to touch uh, the VM or even the compiler. Um, and that's really neat, right? So, I mean, of course, this becomes then like Martin Roderski's like hip hip hooray chant because he believes like, you know, Scala is more awesome for this reason. I mean, the actors look like, um, you know, there's like explicit language support for them because, uh, you know, you've got things that look like keywords in the language but really are just partial functions, right? And it's all a library, but it looks like, it looks like something where you might have to change the parser to make it exist, right? And so for him, it's, a, it's like, a, hey, my language is more general kind of, uh, you know, happy dance, but I think that what's really neat is just the fact that, um, you know, uh, we can have something that looks a lot like these, these uh, Erlang processes, but, you know, not, not on the Erlang VM, which is pretty cool. Um, Cloud Haskell. Does anybody know Cloud Haskell? <coughs> no? Okay, it's actually pretty neat. Um, so, uh, the idea, as it sounds, was, hey, uh, can we extend uh, Haskell to the cloud? What does that mean? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, very similar to like this whole like hip hip hooray like let's let's try to support more things in our programming language. Simon Payton Jones had the same idea. Um, you know, let's let's try to support a different paradigm, a different programming paradigm, but still within Haskell, so that it can be used alongside of other popular abstractions. Uh, for concurrent programming, sort of, that was his goal, and I, I mean, you know, Simon always has, like, really beautiful quotes, so I'm going to read them to you, read one of them to you, and I'll try to do it like Simon, okay, pretty? I think there are really quite a lot of different paradigms for parallel programming in practice, and they differ mainly in their cost model. I'm not a believer in the, si the one-size-fits-all story about parallelism. I think we cannot escape the idea that we, need, we will need to write parallel programs using multiple different uh, paradigms. I would like to build a language, or a language ecosystem, where you can use lots of different kinds of parallelism, the same single application even, uh, where you have maybe bits of task parallelism, bits of data parallelism, and bits of message passing in parallelism, all in the same application. Is it, is it, is that yeah. So anyway, I, I, I wish I was as enthusiastic. Um, so he had this great, you know, th but it's a cool idea, right? Like, Usually we, we have to separate these into different compilers or different languages, different runtimes. But hey, let's try to mix all this in one, right? But again, that was kind of the same idea here, but not really. Like that was more, it was like, hey, is my language more, more flexible? Um, but here he's like, no, I, I want all kinds of concurrency in one language. I'm not really worried about like the DSL capabilities of the language, right? Um, so of course, uh, what do we do? We look to Erlang and we say, well, that seems to work. Um, so let's try to bring message passing and the Erlang pro programming model uh, to Haskell somehow. Let's see if we can do that. And then the argument is that, okay, not only can we do that, but Haskell can do better. Um, whoops. So, I like this. So, if Erlang has been so successful, you may wonder what Haskell brings to the table. The short answer is purity, types, and monads. Of course. <laughs> Obviously. Uh, as a few, but I mean, I mean, there are some good points, okay? As a pure functional language, data is defined uh, by default immutable, so the lack of shared mutable data won't be missed. I agree. Uh, importantly, immutability allows the implementation to decide whether to share or copy the data. The choice is semantically invisible, and so can depend on the locations of the processes. Moreover, pure functions are idempotent, which means that uh, functions running on, a failing hard on failing hardware can easily be restarted elsewhere without the need for distributed transactions or other mechanisms for undoing some kind of uh, effect. Uh, and then we talk more about types, and uh, well, I, I'll keep reading. Uh, types in general and monadic types, our favorite thing, monadic types, uh, in particular help to guarantee the properties of a program statically. For example, a function that has an externally visible effect, such as sending or receiving a message, cannot have the same type as one that is pure. Monadic types make it convenient to program in an effectful style when, it, when that is appropriate, while ensuring that the programmer cannot accidentally mix up the pure and effectful code. Okay. So what does is, what is this thing called Cloud Haskell actually contain? So it contains a notion of, uh, of a process, which are kind of like actors. Uh, and in and, and this Cloud Haskell model, uh, processes are a, a, concurrent, a, a, concurrent, um, a concurrent activity that's been blessed with the ability to send and receive messages, basically. Um, and again, in the same way, uh, they, you know, they are lightweight and uh, they require a little overhead. Um, and uh, I mean, so this, this process M thing, so uh, it, it runs, so basically you've got these, these processes that run within these, these, 
this process M monad, uh, and basically the idea is that it would be hiding all of the uh, the details of maintaining like a mailbox's state, sending and sending and receiving messages, uh, things like that. Uh, and what you then do is you you send messages via these uh, these, these 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 functions called send and expect. Um, oh, and one other interesting thing. Um, uh, there's a, a process that, that uh, yeah, there's a process that uh, uh, matches within this process monad, so that's how you actually receive things. Um, uh, so yeah, you, yeah, exactly, you match, you match, you match uh, messages based on the type. And you, oh, what's cool is that you infer, you, you, you uh, match messages based on the type that you infer uh, from, from the rest of your code. So that's how we get the type of the message that we're looking for. It's kind of not how we do it in Scala. Um, This is not very interesting, um, except uh, so messages are, are are just pieces of data. Sorry, uh, can you can you go back to slide for just a second? Yep. Can you explain the, the, the types of the expect function here? Signatures. These are signatures. Yeah, not over the expect function. So we're we're taking in a what does expect do? Um, so this is the this is the thing where we're like like it's like a receiving thing, right? Um, and it has to, so we're receiving something. Of uh, something, or receiving an A that has to be serializable, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Um, and then it's all, uh, yeah, it's all sort of like wrapped up in this, like, we, we have like a, we get like, like the, the result is like this process M thing, right? Which kind of hides uh, a lot of the details of what it actually does. Um, I don't know if that's any clearer. It's, it's just this type signature. Just the a function. Everything ends in process M. Is that right. Like the yeah. So, so that they, they, so in both cases, you have a process M at the end. Sure, but but you're receiving an A because it looks like the A is already identifiable. That's the signature of the expect thing. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. Okay. It's yeah. A function that goes from A to a process yes. M. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Like you're not writing that. Um, okay, and also an important thing to note is that everything that you're sending around actually has to be serializable, and you have to explain how to serialize things. Uh, but that's that should, you should be you should be doing that anyway is the argument, um, and because everything you know we have types we uh, you know everything has to be going through some some kind of typed channel, um, so uh, you basically the idea is that um, you have some kind of explicit data structure that sends messages of exactly one type on one channel right uh, to exactly one like you know one receiver of which, which expects that type, um, so. There's a notion of, of channels in in, um, in in Cloud Haskell, and also um, you know obviously closures can be problematic because of, of um, you know the, the mess of an environment. So uh, if if you're going to be using closures in Cloud Haskell, they are very restricted, um, and you can only uh, basically what you know the, the rule is that you can only send uh, free variables that are, are either statically bound or variables that are defined at the top level. Otherwise, it, it fails compilation. So. These are kind of like the four special things that make Cloud Haskell uh, Cloud Haskell. So basically, you have like like uh, you know actors, but with these channels going between them, and then you have to do some extra work to serialize things, and you have a restricted kind of closure. Does that make sense? And um, you know, we, we go back to the question of how did we implement these things, or how did they implement these things? Um, Domain-specific language with a little bit of help from template Haskell, so a little bit of meta programming. Uh, but otherwise, domain-specific language with an un... As far as I am... Oh, wait. I think for the closure stuff, they had modified GHC. I'm not sure. But generally unmodified, right? Um, maybe a little bit of template Haskell, but largely domain-specific language slash library. Uh, yep. Okay. Out of curiosity, how did, uh, how did uh, the, the Scala stuff and, and Erlang feel in terms of functions? Scala doesn't do anything. Uh, you just... Everything crashes. Um, so that's one. Um, and Erlang, um, they, I, I actually I forgot. Um, I used to know a lot more about it, but um, you know the, the sands of time and they wipe things out of your memory. But uh, like there is some notion of dealing with environments in Erlang, but I forgot how. Um, but yeah, Scala does everything crashes. Enjoy. Stackers. Um, I mean, but that's the JVM too, right? Uh, it's not just not just Scala, but it's also Java. Um, so, okay, totally weird language that comes out of left field compared to all of the others, uh, because this came from a databases group uh, in Berkeley. Um, I think it's super cool. Um, so this is uh, Peter Alvaro and uh, 
Neil Conway and Joe Hellerstein uh, from UC Berkeley. Um, and, you know, they, I really liked reading their paper and kind of how they talked about the, the real problems that they were facing, right? Because I think that the programming languages community, when they were proposing a lot of these things, you know, they were solving a different set of problems. Um, and the argument was, well, okay, um, there are issues surrounding coordination and consistency that should be dealt with at the level of the programming language, but generally programming languages don't do that. Um, so, you know, let's do it, let's do it, program. let's solve the problem with a programming language called Bloom. Um, and, I mean, uh, so that's, that's the why. And I know this looks ridiculous, but, uh, you know, I'm cherry-picking Peter Alvaro's words, so I will actually make a sentence out of it. Uh, so the argument is that, you know, um, there's the data management community uh, that is experiencing sort of an increase in pressure to help try and find uh, solutions to distributed programming, and largely people focus on ACID, uh, Paxos, two-phase commit, things that provide strong consistency guarantees. However, the belief in 2011, and I think it's still true, uh, is that the cost of these sort of mechanisms for, concur uh, for coordination are really just too high. Um, and, uh, you know, there's this long tradition of um, research and system development that uses application-specific reasoning to tolerate loose consistency arising from flexible ordering of reads and writes and messages. So that's a thing that already exists. Um, and at the same time, there's a body of wisdom and best practices that informs that approach. Uh, yet there are a few so concrete software development tools that actually codify these ideas and sort of like make it easier to achieve without having just some best practices that everybody's supposed to know about. So it's actually unclear uh, which guarantees are provided by specific systems that are even built in these different styles that you know have these these flexible ordering and weak looser consistency guarantees, uh, and then the resulting code ends up being hard to uh, test and hard to trust. So. They, they, you know, that's that's the, the the current state, and their proposal is this language called Bloom, which is a declarative language. Uh, it's a it's a kind of data log uh, that uses program analysis techniques to enable both static and analysis, uh, sorry, static and dynamic analyses uh, that should you know help programmers with uh, with different notions of consistency. Um, so Bloom is like I said, declarative language uh, with these different techniques, program analysis techniques that enable both static and dynamic analysis. Of uh, runtime, uh, I'm sorry, of runtime annotations of consistency. Um, this is all based on this thing called the column principle, whoops, uh, which is a uh, you know so what is what is determined in this analysis that the, well, there's this paper by Joe Hellerstein, 2010, um, and basically uh, the observation is um, uh, that you know uh, rather than basically being able to guarantee um, like a like a, a like the monotonicity or something of like an entire program, um, what we can do instead is provide a conservative ass assessment of the different par points in the program uh, where coordination might be required to ensure uh, some sort of consistency guarantee. So you want to say, okay, these are the important parts of the program that you want to, to focus on, uh, maybe having some coordination here to ensure something, something about the consistency that you want to have. Um, and these are syntactic checks uh, for monotonicity, basically. Um, important things to note that you wouldn't expect uh, if you don't think about data logs. Um, no notion of ordering. Uh, programs are bundles of declarative statements about collections of tuples. And everything has a timestamp. You define things uh, in your language, uh, you know, relative to, to some point in time. Um, but the full thing is no mutable state and everything is side effect free. Um, and so you have these collections of objects and operations that you have on these objects. So these are a bunch of the operations. Uh, wait, yep, these are, yep, yeah, yeah, so these are, I'm sorry, these are all the collections and these are, uh, these are the various operations. Um, I'm not going to go into uh, a lot of detail about this because I'm running uh, close to time. Um, but uh, there are also things that, like in addition to these sort of simple operations, like these declarative operations, you also have these, uh, you know, Things like map and fold and stuff, or map, map or whatever, reduce, um, and uh, uh, you know, it's it, you end up with these 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 programs that kind of look like, yeah, I mean, you know, like these sort of like map reduce kind of programs a little bit, um, and uh, it's all in, in in the context of these these modules. You 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 uh, define all of these these programs in a model uh, in a module, and actually the order of the statements don't matter because. Uh, again, this is a, this is a, or like, you know, Bloom is meant to be this, this language order should never matter, right? Um, and your runtime analysis should be able to figure out if certain parts of your program should be coordinating. And what's interesting is that 
uh, Bloom is implemented in Ruby, uh, and it's just the Ruby class definition. Um, so that's also interesting. It's another domain specific language, kind of sort of. It's a library. Yep. I know you're running out of time, but yep. you, sure. you mentioned that motivation for the language was to help uh, programmers to get an intuition about you know, the consistency models. And, yep. But I, don't, I, I, don't, I, I don't think that was exactly it. I think it's more just uh, languages don't have any support for consistency, was the argument. And uh, so let's, let's, let's uh, point to specific points in the program with this static analysis that will say where you should be introducing coordination. So I don't think uh, it, it, I don't think the intention was, hey, let's teach people about coordination, but like, let's try to catch where they might have to coordinate and tell them where. Um, I'm going to talk about this for two seconds, and then I'm going to uh, we'll start to wrap up. But there's a, a, a language by, by Chris Mickeljohn and Peter Van Roy called LASP. Um, it's, uh, it's ongoing work, and this was a, a, you know, a picture of this, this, this language in 2015. Um, so now it's 2015, right? So you know, let's forget about it's like tuple spaces and sorts of problems, or like the, the bank accounts and things like this that we were talking about in 1988. Um, instead, the applications that we're looking at are things like mobile games, where you, you know they're available, uh, you know they're on and offline, right? Um, you have the like internet of whatever things. Uh, also, everybody loves ad counters. These things kind of operate on and offline. Um, and coordination uh, is a ridiculous idea when when uh, you know one app has to make three calls to three dozen different different services while it's being used. You have a UI that's just making like 30,000 requests to different things and you don't want everything to be blocking, right? Um, so uh, this work is basically all about uh, trying to, well, certain parts of your application uh, has to have to be replicated sometimes. And the idea here is, okay, well, we take this notion of CRDT, which I think a lot of people have, have begun to hear about uh, in recent years, but build these things into the language as like the data types that you operate on. And just to give you a quick, like, two-second uh, introduction to what a CRDT is, uh, you can think of them as a data type that can be replicated all over a network. Um, and if you update a local copy of that thing, um, you can be guaranteed that eventually the other local, or the other copies on other nodes will have the same, uh, you know, be eventually consistent. Your two replicas will be consistent eventually, <laughs> and you know, operations can happen in, in sort of different orders, basically. But you all are guaranteed sort of like the, cons the same consistent view of the data eventually when when things co eventually coalesce. Um, and uh, there's a lot of different kinds. I mean, this is a, a kind of an active research area, um, but you can have lots of data structures like sets, counters, registers, dictionaries, graphs, things like that, implemented as CRDTs, and LASP tries to make like a, a programming language that has CRDT data structures built into it. And uh, the idea, the big idea here is let's try to build uh, convergent uh, computations into the language by composing together these CRDTs. Um, and so uh, you have a, in this language or in this DSL, you have a core, a core API, which you know declares and reads and things like this, update, bind, things that you you would expect. But then you have this nice functional API where you have a map and a fold and a filter and things like that. And you also have a set theoretic API, and all of these things are uh, operating typically on these these uh, these CRDT things. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot more about it because I don't have any time. But uh, again, let's, let's ask how it's implemented. Well, it's an Erlang library. Um, and it used to be built on top of React, but now uh, it's, it's, it's built on something else. Uh, but you have these, these state-based CRDTs kind of as your data structures in your language. Um, and cool, so Erlang library. So wait, like, let's, let's think about it for a second now. Okay, so I, I think that was like seven, right? Like we went to, through too many, I hope you're all exhausted. Um, but then I didn't answer the question, like what happened to all the distributed languages? I kind of just went through time, right? Uh, we started with a bunch of, of compilers that were coupled to kernels um, and often required a specific kernel and couldn't even run anything else uh, on the same, you know, on, in the same kernel. Like only only this, 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 or, or this Emerald application, for example. And eventually things became more portable. Uh, and then we saw a lot of languages being realized as effectively domain-specific languages. Um, so my argument, I guess, is that uh, I don't think that um, distributed programming languages actually went anymore. Um, like, let's think back to the Simon Payne Jones uh, quote. Let's try to mix different concurrency. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, let's try to, to to make different concurrency models within the same language. Um, but now these are are distributed programming models that are implemented as, as DSLs now, or libraries, or whatever you want to call it, depending on the language and how you embed it in your language. Um, oops, wrong way. Uh, so, you know, things that people are beginning to propose, I mean, we're proposing nowadays programming models more than actual new languages and new compilers, and we typically embed these things in the existing language. And so if we go all the way back to, uh, you know, like how I kind of started to talk with this, like, silly animation, 
Um, I look at this kind of like a text, text, text message kind of conversation where you have you know, different uh, languages making interesting points, right? Or if I go, we, you know, we, we summarize all the things that we just saw, we have Argus appearing in 1988, around the same time as Emerald. Emerald was in 1987, I think. Um, but they're roughly around the same time, and you have Argus appear and say, hey, consistency is important. Uh, we should have support for strong consistency in our language, but also, hey, uh, partial failure is important, you know, nobody, nobody worries about that. RPC is cool, we should have that in our language, and, you know, eventually promises appear. So, like, these are the important things. And then Emerald appears, it's like, hey guys, uh, op, you know, we should have a, you know, object-oriented programming is awesome. We should have one unified object model for, uh, you know, for our distributed programming language. And not only that, but our objects should be mobile. Um, and they should be efficient too. It shouldn't be just some slow thing that barely works. They should be efficient mobile objects. Uh, so object-oriented programming, mobile objects, yay. Uh, Erlang appears, well, no, 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 guys. Uh, message passing is the most important thing, and we should have many lightweight processes. They should be many and light. They should be totally independent so we can garbage collect them too, right? That's what's important. Um, Linda appears uh, and kind of comes out of left field like, guys, 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 you're all wrong. All of you are totally wrong. Actually, message passing is totally crazy uh, because it requires all of this, like, you have to think about individual machines in the network, and you have to be doing point to point, point communication between them. It's a lot of effort to think about it. Uh, shared memory is actually intuitive, and it's natural, and I mean, what if we made tuple spaces efficient? Like, that's, that would be great, right? So if we could think about shared, you know, programming with shared memory and not have to worry about point-to-point -point communication, uh, and if we made this efficient, that, that's more awesome, right? Uh, and then you have, then you have the, 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 the newer, like, languages, which are more like libraries appearing, say, hey, look, my language is awesome. We don't need a VM for anything. We can make lightweight processes without VMs, without VM support, because we can just, you know, have a library. Isn't that cool? Uh, you know, so, hey, my language has good support for domain-specific languages. That was Scala, right? Cloud Haskell appears. Well, it would be cool if we had message passing in Haskell, uh, but we can do it better because we have types and monads. Uh, and, you know, it would be really awesome if we can mix these different concurrency models in one language, right? So that's what, that's what uh, Cloud Haskell's value proposition was. And then now we have, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of, you know, databases folks are appearing and being like, look, guys, you programming languages people, you're totally worrying about all the wrong things. Um, you know, d things should always be monotonic, and uh, consistency is important. That should actually be built into the programming model. Things like data log are awesome. So, I mean, let's go back to that. Uh, and then, you know, languages like LASP appears like, wait, guys, okay, yes, I agree. Consistency is important. Uh, but so is composability. You know, all that stuff that we did for a long time, that's important too. Let's, let's compose together up, like compose up together uh, uh, interesting computations that, you know, we that have some sort of guarantees about consistency. Let's put that in a language. So, I mean, I look at it like that, right? Like, I mean, this is kind of a, a hilarious little argument between different programming languages designers. But, uh, you know, it, it's kind of fun to see how it might have evolved, the different value propositions and arguments that each of these languages kind of put forward. And with that, I will, I, will, uh, I will end, and I know that I'm, uh, I'm at the limit, so we could probably do questions maybe as we filter out of the room. And here, if you care about the references and some of the talks, or some of the papers, you can come take a picture of this if you want to read any of them. But thank you. Okay. Uh, can everybody hear me in the back? Good. So today, I'm going to talk about paradigms of probabilistic programming. Um, before I, I dive into the technical content, though, just a few words of motivation. So um, we might have we might have forgotten, but uh, ten years ago, I actually think there was the sort of early signs of peak excitement about machine learning and big data. Um, so, for example, the editor in chief of Wired wrote an article saying that the data deluge was going to make the scientific method.